specific. I'm going to go over some, some strategies, um, not necessarily all project management strategies. They're going to be a little bit also on if you're a lead developer, if you're a freelancer, um, if you're any type of independent developer or company. Um, it's going to be kind of broad, but it's all going to be about the idea of managing WordPress projects or, or content management type projects um, and making them successful. So I'll give a quick introduction of myself. Um, my name is Matthew Dorman. I, I do have a background in, in development, computer science. Yeah, sure. <coughs> Bring it up a little bit. Is that is that better? Yeah. yeah. I'll talk a little louder too. Okay. So I do have a background in development in uh, computer science, but I do manage a lot of projects as well. I uh, I run our open source group at, at North Point. Uh, North Point's a technology consulting firm. We're based in New York, but we also have a, an office in Boston. So you know, it's grown from being you know a, a developer into a lead management roles into you know project management type roles as well, so kind of giving you some background, some, some insights into the projects that I've worked on um, in the past. Some of these are very specific to WordPress, and some of them are, again, specific to uh, project management in general or, work, or web development. Um, so some of the projects I've managed, or clients I've managed, a lot of media publishing clients, some of them before North Point, some of them during North Point, but they're not all WordPress projects, but they're all in some way focused on the same type of things that WordPress does, so you know, content, um, updating content frequently, the same type of process as far as development, or sorry, wireframing design, development, uh, and launching. So the outline of the, uh, the presentation, I'm gonna go through some extra resources, and these are things that, you know, things that you can take away afterwards, um, some, some areas, places where you can grow your, your knowledge a little bit more. Um, go through a, a few common project management tools. These are things that we use at North Point, but I use independently, as well as some, some of the people I work with, they use. Um, these are all pretty much online tools, um, helping you either manage a project, manage communication, um, and things like that. Um, and then a, a slide about setting standards. Um, standards are very important for projects, so whether, even if it's your, your own self, setting standards for yourself to do in development and things like that. Um, and then I'll, I'll go through a, a quick slide about some tech, techniques and methodologies that are kind of just some key words. Uh, around project management, just so you can give you some descriptions that, in case you're not familiar with some of them, or if you've heard them and, and had questions about them. Um, and then primarily, uh, a lot of it will be focused on a lot of the questions to get answered. Um, these are questions during a project, so you know things that you need to get done, things that you need to have on a checklist or something like that. All the slides will be available. I'll, I'll post them on, onto the original um, on the on campsite. So there's a number of questions you don't feel like you're, you have to jot them down real quick, so they'll be available. So I'll get right into it. And the other thing is, since we have the podium, uh, the mic will probably reserve the questions till, till afterwards, just so it can be a little more organized. But you know, write them down and come up later. Uh, so extra resources. This is all about getting involved, right? Um, this is an open source product, uh, uh, open source community. We need, we need to be engaged with the community, engaged with developers. So monthly WordPress meetups. If you're a non-technical person, if you are a project manager or a project lead, um, going to the meetups. You know, there are developers at, at all these meetups. But there's also um, other business folks, uh, other people that are trying to get engaged with using WordPress. Um, the developers can help you learn what features are available. You're going to hear about what things are coming available. Um, so it's a great resource for you to do, whether you can do it on a monthly basis or maybe every other month, but trying to, to attend uh, when you can or read about what, what went on in the meetups. Um, this is the Boston one, but obviously I'm, I'm in New York. There's one in New York as well. Pretty much any regional area has, has meetups. Um, they all happen on different, different days of the month. So, so do some research and find one that's close to you. Work camps, you're here, so you can check that one off the list. Um, but there are a lot of work presses. We're in the Northeast right now. There's work presses in um, New Hampshire, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, um, obviously Boston. So they're all over the place. You know, maybe you you got a lot here, but you, you know, it's your first time. Um, go to another one. You're gonna, you're going to gain a little bit more knowledge. And then of course WordPress.org. There's tons of information on WordPress.org. Um, but one of the areas that you can get a lot of information and get a lot of answers also is, is the support area where you can post some questions or you can just search for, for questions. If you do a search on Google, a lot of times you're going to end up here anyways um, for, for some quick answers or other forums out there. Um, but obviously the WordPress.org one is, is you know, tight and close to the community. But in essence, you know, get involved. If you're a developer, you're probably are already pretty involved, but if you're more of a you know, business person or a project manager, um, maybe you haven't gotten involved in the open source community yet, or the WordPress community, um, so, so start to. Um, you'll, you'll learn a lot more, and it'll, 
it'll help you build your career, build, uh, build uh, better projects as well. So some of the tools that, that we use or, or I've used in the past, there's a number of paid ones. I'll click here and I'll, I'll give you some descriptions on them. Um, uh, these are all paid systems. They're, they're ho a number of them are hosted systems. Um, so they're easy. You, you go up, you create an account, and then you all of a sudden have an ability to, to add some users and to, to start some communication. Uh, we use Jira with the Greenhopper plugin because we do a lot of you know, large scale projects where we're doing agile based um, development. So we have user stories, we have tasks associated with those stories, we have our, our project teams need burn down notes. <coughs> It provides all of that, and you know you can download it, but we prefer to do the host version um, because it's one less thing for us to support. We do a lot of development for clients. We don't want them to have to do a lot of development for ourselves. Um, but at, at the end of the slide, I'll give you some open source versions that you can actually host. This is one that you can host yourself as well. Um, but then Basecamp is another one. So what we found was Jira was pretty good for creating tasks and, and creating stories. It was actually originally a, an issue tracking system uh, or a bug tracking system. But the communication was a little bit difficult in it. So Basecamp allows us to do basically get rid of email um, and provide us a way to have a web-based tool for communication and, and documents, um, storage of documents. So you can upload a document. You can have a communication about that. You can get emails if you really like email, or you can delete all those emails and always go back to the site um, and then review them. You can do searches. So it's a really good tool. But it is a paid tool, so you, so you have to keep that into consideration. Pivotal Tracker, very similar, similar tool. A little bit lower cost, um, but more geared towards um, Agile and Scrum. Um, it, that's what it was originally built for. But these three tools, there's, there's other ones as well. These just happen to be the ones we've used, and, and I, I know they work pretty well. Um, but then the open source ones, right? We're, we're in an open source meetup. Um, these, are, these are the ones we want to look at as well. So if you have the time to, to host something yourself, um, Open Atrium is, it happens to be you know, based on Drupal, the other uh, open source PHP content management system. Um, but it's one of those out-of-the-box tools that you, you download, you install it if you have a server in MySQL already. It, it's up and running, and you don't have to really support it other than the, the hosting around it. So you can add to it if you want, if you have the development resources, or you can add, you know, there's other open source plugins, and, or in this case modules, that, that allow you to extend it. Um, and, it's, and it's your own, so you can do whatever you want with it. And of course it's free, so, so that's the bigger part for, for smaller groups or smaller teams. Um, Redmine and Track are, are two others um, that, that are very similar where you can download it, you can install it. Um, if you have the technical capabilities to install these things, um, that's, that's a benefit. But if you don't, the, the hosted one, ones are the way to go. There are other cheaper hosted ones as well. But it, in essence, you, know, you definitely need some type of tools. Even if you're doing, you know, using Google Docs, that's at least a tool. It's, it's for sharing content, and sharing um, documents, and a spread, cell spreadsheet within Google Docs uh, for, for bugs. That's at least something, um, but these are these are a little bit more advanced as well and help you track those things. So I want to get into some of the meat of the, the presentation, right? The, so setting some standards. This is what's going to help you start doing projects a little bit better, um, even if it's yourself. You know, setting standards for yourself is also important if, if you're a sole developer or a freelancer. Um, but, but even more key when you're working on a larger team. Very important to start using version control systems. You know, this is subversion. Um, Git is, is the most popular gaining traction right now. Um, you know, when you're a single person, you kind of have the, the allure to, to just do it without version control because you're only one person. But even if you're a single person, um, this helps you maintain almost a backup or versions of your system so you know at different iterations what, what you're doing. And this is really more development lines, of course, but you know, as, a, as a manager, you should, you should um, push this. Um, now, if you work for a larger corporation, obviously you have to or a company, you have to help, have them do things, these types of things, but you know, push them up or push them down depending on your role. So code reviews, building out local environments. Um, if you're a developer or a lead develop, developer, you're in charge of this. If you're a project manager, make sure your lead developer is doing this. Um, or if you're, you're doing it yourself, you know, it's a little bit difficult to do code reviews, but there are systems out there that can scan your code and make sure your syntax is correct. Um, there's even security ones that you can, you can apply. Um, and then local environments, obviously it's a little different if you're a single person, but if you're a group, try to keep those local environments um, as similar as possible. This is really more in the case of you know, PHP versions or MySQL versions, um, making sure that your local environment is very similar to the development or, or the shared development or, or production environment is key because you, know, you don't want to get through the development process um, or during the development process and one person's having this issue and they lose a day of development because, well, their PHP version was, 
PHP 4 or something, or, or even, even the most recent versions are, can cause issues with, with notices so that redirects don't work and things like that. So keeping them all similar or very similar, at least knowing which ones aren't, is important. Um, some performance metrics. You know, these sites that we're building, we're building on a dynamic content management system. It's not, you know, back you know, five or, or further years ago where we were building out flat HTML pages for, you know, five-page, ten-page marketing sites. Uh, this is a dynamic CMS. Um, it's doing dynamic database calls. You're adding plugins that can eventually create more um, dynamic database calls. So having some performance metrics, having some a set of standards of how fast we, we need this site to perform, and then keeping monitoring that um, throughout the process is, is pretty key because you don't want to get to the end of the day and all of a sudden the client or you know your your boss says, well, why is the site so slow and when did it happen, right? At least if you if you set some metrics, you're starting to, to monitor it. You, you know at what point it happened, um, or at least an idea of what plugin you added um, to start to slow the site down. Now this is really key for long-term maintenance, of course. Using the, the WordPress API library, uh, I can't really stress this enough, other than a couple other other ones I'll, I'll point out. But don't write a lot of custom code for accessing the database. And that's I'll, I'll show this one as well. Um, there's a lot of it already written. There, you know, if you're doing some request for content that's in core, or if you're trying to show some lesser things, or even markup, there's a lot of APIs out there within the core um, that can be leveraged w without having to write things yourself. And that what this means is that if you write it yourself, you basically own it, you have to then maintain it long term. But if you're writing it with the API already, there's a larger group of people that are going to own it and, and help you maintain it for you. And this is very, you know, this is kind of key as well. You shouldn't have, or you should try not to have as much, you know, custom SQL scripts. If you write your own custom plugin with this own custom uh, database table, that's different. Um, but you shouldn't really be writing too many custom queries against WordPress core. If you are, if you find an absolute need, maybe it's for performance, maybe you can contribute that back, and then you can get it into the core, um, core WordPress, and then it can be again supported by a larger group. Um, but part of this, you know, no custom SQL queries in the theme. Um, this is part of your standards, should be part of your standards. The theme is where the presentation uh, happens. It's where there are all the HTML, the CSS, some, some good, you know, decent amount of PHP, but not really data access, so not custom SQL queries or, or custom development in, in, the, in the theme. Having a plug-in review process. I'm not talking about the ones you, you write yourself. I'm talking about the ones that you're going to download and install. Um, you know, there's plenty of awesome, incredible plugins out there, but there's also other ones that or maybe in, in different states of, of support. Um, maybe they haven't upgraded to, to the you know, recent years of, of WordPress, but they you know, have a good adoption. So having some type of a review process, that can be you know, just you know, your lead developer can put that in, in place, kind of having you know, how many years has it been out, how many people have installed it, um, what version is it actually being supported by, um, to all the way down to having someone actually review the, the lines of code. Um, you, know, it doesn't, you don't have to review every, every line of code to, for every plugin. If you're someone that's more of like a site builder or a person that puts plugins together and puts a theme together, obviously you don't have to review all the lines of code, but you should do some research. You should look on the web, see what other people are using um, in their comments about plugins. Um, and then there's a, there's a really great plugin that automa uh, some, some of the people that automatically built uh, called the developer plugin. There's other ones as well, but it, I, we really like this one. It gives you some step-by-step -step instructions on kind of how to enhance or, or, or make sure that you're doing things in, in the right way. Um, so this isn't something you necessarily put on a live site, but you put in your local or put in, in a shared development site. So you can, it gives you a number of options, a number of things that, that it checks for. Um, it, it can tell you if there, certain things are out of date. Um, it's a really great plugin, of one of many, obviously. So outside of standards, um, getting back into kind of more of the project management aspect. And again, these are just terms that I want to go through. Um, we've, got, we've got four here. There's a bunch more, but these are kind of the more common ones. Um, we tend to we tend to do mix the first two. You know, everyone is trying to push for oh, we want to do all agile development, all all agile and Scrum. But what we find as a consulting company, we can't really do that. We have to we have to come up with a proposal, which means our client has to come up with a lot of the requirements up front. So we have to mix waterfall and, and agile. What Agile is, is really kind of iterating through, um, getting, figuring out what you want to do while you're doing development or right before you're doing development. Where Waterfall, you're doing you know, a bunch of requirements gathering up front and then kind of stepping through. So most people have, you know, are very well versed.
first in waterfall. Agile is still, you know, while it's been a few years, um, somewhat new, and, and there's a lot of mixture of, of the two. But we like to mix it only because we need to give an estimate, we need to give a timeline for our clients. Um, so we have to come up with that greater picture, which is the waterfall. But then within it, we do sprints um, that we can report into to the client as a, you know, milestones and things like that. Um, and then some other ones that are not really related, but test-driven development is, is something that's pretty popular as well. Um, this is generally for bigger teams or, or decent-sized teams where everything you build should have had a requirement, which also should have had a test, so that you can test against the requirements and say, all right, this piece of functionality was tested, um, and it's before you get into a formal QA. It just it speeds up the whole process, but it also makes the development process a little bit longer because it's an extra code that developers have to write, and it's a different way of having to, to think about development. Um, and then another one is, is called pair programming. Um, and this is one where it, a lot of people really shy away from because what basically happening is you have two physical people um, sitting in front of one computer, one keyboard, right? So most people think, well, you're getting half the, half the uh, you know, output. But what really happens is that both of them are sharing, sharing knowledge, they're, they're gaining experience from each other, but they're, they're building at a much faster rate or developing at a much faster rate than, than two single people can actually do anyways. Because what happens with a single developer is they build something, they iterate through, and they, they change a lot of things, they, they might gut it completely. So that's a lot of lost time, but when you have two people going through things um, and, and feeding off of each other, you know, if you can, uh, it has a lot of benefits. But you know, bigger teams generally because you have to have two people um, sitting at a desk. Can you explain waterfall one more time? Yes. Um, so visually, visually it, it sounds like what it is. It's a waterfall. So what has to happen is everything has to be complete, and then it comes down to a, another phase in, in the project. So first phase, you, know, you have to do your, your requirements gathering. So you get all your requirements, and then you can't start the UI or, or wireframing until all your requirements are done in tr totally traditional waterfall. And then you can't start your visual design until your UI is done. And then you can't start your development instead of until your uh, visual design. Um, you know, traditional waterfall really never was adopted very well because yeah, other than really you know, software development. But in web development, everything always crossed over. You always started your, your design before wireframe. You always started development before designs. And that's still the case today. Um, sometimes you're actually finishing your development before design finishes. Um, so again, I'm going to go through these pretty quickly, um, but the idea here is there's a lot of questions that you should get answered during a project. Um, there's before questions, there's during it, and then also launch and after launch. Um, but I'm, I'm going to have the slides up available just so, so we don't spend a ton of time and we have um, time at the end for questions. Um, but I will go into detail on a few of the questions because they are pretty critical um, for success. So what happens before the project begins? Right? This is, you know, it depends on, on your organization. Maybe it's before you're getting your estimate together um, for a client, or maybe you're at a you know, you're at a company and it's just planning because you already have <coughs> the ideas together. And you just have to get some things together. Um, what's important, right? The launch date and, and what's driving that launch date. A couple of things that this is important for. Um, obviously, so you can plan. You can plan to when when you have to finish the project, but also um, knowing what's driving that date is important because most likely. Um, you're going to have to either adjust something, as we all know. You're going to either have to adjust the date, um, bring on extra resources, or cut functionality. Um, and if you know what drives the date, you can know if this can actually move. If it can't move, then something else may have to be adjusted later on. Similarly, what are the business goals and drivers for this project? Right? Is this, is this the most important thing we're doing this year, and we have to get it done um, no matter what it costs? Or is it just you know, it's a simple functionality addition that we need to get done, Maybe we can use a lot of um, off-the-shelf product or off-the-shelf plugins and, and just get the, the basic functionality out the door. So that kind of can help you uh, scope out the project and decide how much, how many resources you want to add to it. And then, how many resources do I actually have? If you're being told this, um, you need to know how many, or maybe how much money. If you're a consulting company or a freelancer, how much money am I being given? So how many hours um, am I going to actually have? Sometimes you're told this because a client knows exactly what they want and they're telling you exactly how much they can pay. Sometimes you have to help them um, come up with that number or you tell them that number. Um, this is pretty key for a, for a content management system, especially WordPress, right? Um, who's editing the site right now? And have they ever used a CMS before? There's a couple of variations of this. Uh, sometimes it's a company, you know, someone that owns a company 
and they write all their content and they hand it off to a developer and either gets put into a CMS or an HTML page. Or at larger corporations, it's some type of a writer who writes a bunch of stuff in Word and then hands it off to a producer. Or maybe they, you know, they had some HTML experience and they were doing all flat HTML um, pages. Um, or they're they're more advanced and they have you know Drupal or Joomla or work, or happen to have WordPress. So knowing if they had any experience, if they're going to need it in the future, because that's going to impact um, some type of training. So it's not all about all right, I'm building out a site and then I just hand it off because we launched. You have to help these people, um, the content creators, manage their site because that's you know from day one, from once they start building or once you launch the site, they now have to maintain most likely. So they need training. They need to know how to use the CMS. Hopefully, you're doing that during testing and, and user acceptance testing. But you need to know how much training that is necessary. And then, it, is there an easier solution? Right? Um, can we do this with uh, a bunch of just out of the box plugins, or do I need to do some custom development? Um, and, and in general, is there an easier solution out there? In my opinion, you know, WordPress. You're not going to find a much easier content management system. Um, for the end user or for development, um, but for other systems that, that we work with, it's definitely the case. We work with big, large-scale you know, enterprise systems that can do pretty much anything you ever want as far as workflow and content deployment, but they may not even need anything like that. So you go all the way down to different levels of, of what's needed and cost. So, so there may or may not be an easier solution. Um, maybe they just need a Twitter account. I mean, that, that would be one example of you know, something that's easier than, than WordPress, obviously. Uh, or just, you know, they just need a site on WordPress.com and it's not a custom development, de developed site. Another pretty key in information is, is where are we hosting? Um, if you're hosting internally or you're, you know, you have full, full control over that, it, that, that brings up a certain amount of issues or not issues. Um, but if you're hosting it somewhere else, let's say you're hosting with VIP or you're hosting with um, WP Engine, another, another sponsor at the event. Uh, or some other hosting facility, they may have very specific requirements of what you can do um, in their environment. They might have specific PHP requirements, they might have specific caching requirements. So you have to know where you're hosting so that you can actually build the, or have your developers build for, the, for that environment. Um, so you need to get that information up front because that could have cost implications as well. And then, you know, a couple of good questions are, are when will design be final? If you're a lead developer, you need to know that. But, but really, you know, when, when are they actually going to be done? Because everyone puts a date of when the designs are final, but that date is you know, not the designer's fault at all, but you know, because of a lot of different issues, the designs are always a little bit late. Um, and knowing when they're actually going to be around is, is pretty critical. Uh, so while the project is running, um, if, if you're doing Agile Scrum, you're going to know this all the time, what the blockers are. Um, you need to ask this on a daily basis if you're doing Agile Scrum, but ask this on a, on a frequent basis because if you're if you're a project manager and you have developers under you or, or working with you, they're not always going to tell you the block because they want to figure it out, they want to get through it. Um, but helping them out, maybe it's you know, getting getting them in touch with a more senior person is just critical to get done early. I'm getting an idea of what the current site URLs are because you know, this could be done earlier, but if you haven't had this done, you need a, a list of the current site URLs. You can get an idea of functionality, you can get an idea of scope, how many pages have to be built, how many pages have to be migrated as well. Um, and then do we, you know, when you're doing development, do we really need, you know, X number of plugins? Can we have, you know, one plugin that does those five, the, the things that those five plugins do? Can we write, you know, five lines of custom code that, that take advantage of everything that we need? Um, you know, get some answers from, from your developer or think about it yourself. Um, and another good one is, you know, that, that plugin is still in, in dev or alpha or beta. Um, do we have time to fix the issues that are likely going to come up? Um, some, some plugins are, are in dev because the developer never feels comfortable, but it's a perfectly great plugin and you know it's been out for years or something. But some are, are very new, so there are going to be issues with some of those plugins. Um, and, and that's not to say that, you know, any plugin that you write yourself is really in essentially alpha or beta because no one else is testing it other than yourself. So it's not that those are any worse than something you're going to write yourself necessarily. So launch planning, right? This is, this is the idea that, all right, I've, I've gone through development, I'm getting really close to the end, and I need to start re getting ready to launch the, the site. So what's, what's the first thing you need to think about? Well, rolling back because you might 
have missed something, the client might decide they want something totally different, or something is wrong in the production environment that just you didn't catch. So you need to be able to have a rollback plan. And another key part of that is, did you actually test the rollback plan? Because the worst thing you can do is get to the point where you need to do the rollback plan, and then it, it just doesn't work. Um, so test it, make sure it's you know consistent, and you have everything, all the steps necessary to go forward and back. Um, and of course, the cutover plan actually launching it, um, and who's responsible for every step. Um, making sure that you have, you know, if you need system administrators, if you just need, you know, someone available to, to click a button, or if you need an entire team, um, get it, getting all those people together, um, getting a list of names, and, and, and later I'll say you know, all their contact information as well. Another key one is, this is more technical, but the TTL, the time to live on the domain. A lot of times when you're doing a site upgrade or doing a, a replatform from, let's say, Drupal or Joomla to WordPress or static HTML, uh, you're possibly moving to a different host um, or a different server. So what that means is this, this is a, a direct mapping from the domain to, to an IP address or, or a physical address. Um, and what happens is a lot of times those, those caching is, is set to a pretty high number, um, to up to a month. Um, if you switch over the site and then just you know, make the change, for a month, and it's not really that long, but it, it changes quicker, but for a month possibly, you'll have users that used to be using your site and still using the old site um, because they're caching. You can't go out and tell every user, oh, change your cache and, and update it. Um, so what you have to do, if it's a month, a month before you launch, you have to start lowering it. Um, and when you get really close, you know, the 30 minutes is, is about enough because it gives you enough time to kind of fix things in that 30 minute window. But it's really key to, to get that, that lower number. Now there's other systems out there, Dynamic DNS and other systems that doesn't really require that. And other ways to roll back as well if you get into the situation where you're in. Yes? Is TTL title? Is that what you mean by that? No, it's, it's a, so TTL is time to live. Oh, okay. So it, it's, a, it's a term based on a, it's a technology term, so it's, it's really caching or the amount of time that it takes from the, uh, the point where, where they say you know, the first person that uses the site for, for maybe 30 minutes or for an hour or for you know, 30 days, it doesn't have to look up that address again. Uh, is, this, is that line essentially a domain switch that you're referring to? Yes. So, okay. Well, not a domain switch. So in this case, this is a, in the case of you're moving hosts um, to a different facility maybe um, or just upgrading a server. So it's not necessarily, oh, I'm just doing a, a quick upgrade or, or, or staying on a physical server. That's not usually the case. Um, or if I'm in a big network environment and it's the IP address of the, you know, the route or the, the firewall or the load balancer, that usually doesn't change. This is the case where you're switching environments completely. Is that it's an ISP host setting? It's a, so you're, wherever you, you uh, registered your domain, it, it gives you a, a tool to, to say your domain maps to an IP address um, or a set of IP address. So whether you host with a big hosting provider, Sometimes they manage that, but they give you a, a, a tool to, to change it. Um, or you're hosting for, you know, you could host with Yahoo, you could host with GoDaddy, or, or you have your domain on, on Yahoo, GoDaddy, um, a number of other, other organizations do it as well. They all provide interfaces to do this. So it, it gives you a, a way of mapping that, you know, the text domain to a physical IP address on the server. Why don't you want to set it as short as possible? So, so the idea here is that it's performance-based. So Long term, you, you don't want it short because every every time they, they look it up, that's an extra lookup that the for every image, let's say on the page, it has to look it up. So it's a little bit of a performance thing. So if you have it a, a few days, generally is fine. A week, um, that's usually perfectly fine. But if you if you know you're you're going to stay there forever, um, a month, um, set it to a month. But either way, even if it's a few days or a day, you want to get it down to 30 minutes before you're ready to launch. Good questions. Um, this is pretty key. We, we all love SEO. We all love Google. Um, you know, a lot of times during development, you put up a public site, and then you protect it with a password. But a lot of times, the the, the quick way of doing it is ed editing your robots file to say, you know, Google, don't look at this dev site. Um, don't crawl it because I don't want all the extra e URLs in the site, and I don't want public pe people finding it. Well, what happens is that sometimes you leave that up and you launch, and then days later, you're like. Where's where's all my Google and where's all my SEO traffic? Well, you didn't change your, your robots.txt file. So get this in a list somewhere. Uh, make sure it's it's one of those things that you check off be before you're, you're launching. And obviously, this is this at least is one of those things that you change and it gets stressed pretty quickly because Google is in any any spider is actually looking at this file fairly frequently. So if you update it, it's going to get addressed pretty quickly. But you know you don't want it up for days, obviously. 
because as an end user, you know, your, your client, everyone's never looking at this file, so, so no one even knows about it. Um, and this relates back to the, one of the earlier ones, but you need to have the contact information for all the team members. Everyone that's going to be doing the launch, um, maybe it's a night launch, if it's a big project, uh, but you need to have everyone's contact information. Um, and as much contact information to, as possible, um, you know, email address it isn't really enough, phone number might be enough, um, but you know, maybe their friend's phone number if it's really important, if you know that they, you know, they like to sleep in or, or like to go out and party, I guess. Um, but you know, you'll know your, your team members better than you know, I would, obviously. Um, and then, of course, for a big project, so you're, if you're all working on site, you know, people like to celebrate. So it's usually stressful, and you, you have to get through it in one way or another, but making sure the beer is cold. And as a lead, that's your, your job. Um, so after launch, right, everything, we've done everything we can to get the site up. Um, it's up and running. It, it's out there. We're not going to roll back. We've decided to keep going. Maybe we have some bugs. We often do have bugs because you've got a lot more users looking at the site. Um, if you're in a big organization, you know, finally the president decides to finally look at the site or the CEO. Um, they didn't look at it all, all during the process, but now they are. So now they're reporting bugs. But, but we're pushing through it. So did we meet our success criteria? That's a good question to ask. You know, this is the post-mortem process, finding out so the next project can be even more successful. But you're not going to make it all perfect. Um, I don't make any, my projects are never all perfect. We always have things we learn from. Um, and then what can we, what could we have done better as a team? But also, what can we have done better as an individual? If you're the lead, if you're a lead, you know, sole developer, um, maybe you could have engaged with the client a little bit better. Maybe you could have asked a few more questions up front um, about the project, about the, the things that they want. Because um, that, well, that's one of the other things I, I like to mention is that you know, you're not always building what they're telling you that they, they want or that they're telling they need. It's really, you have to build what they, they really do need. Um, and you need to know what their business is a little bit, possibly, um, or at least get involved in, in some of the things that they're doing um, outwardly. Because if, if you just do everything that they've, they've listed out, you're definitely missing a lot of things. Um, this is going back into development, but who's tracking our 404s and our errors, right? Because we, we launched the site, we have some pages, and hopefully we picked up the redirects um, if we did a migration. Uh, but there's likely to be some 404s, missing images, missing pages, um, and things like that, or errors, PHP errors um, on the, on the uh, WordPress site. So have someone tracking it. It doesn't have to be you know, constant. Maybe it's come up for, night, for the night launch. But going forward, every, every so often, have someone look at it. Maybe you can have some reports generated. There's a lot of plugins that do that as well. Um, and then what are, start looking at your metrics, or have the, you know, the site owners start looking at their metrics. Um, is, are they, uh, is, is the traffic going down or up? Um, if, if the traffic's going down, is our bandwidth also is going up or down? So compare these things. You know, maybe you have a, a lot of big images now on the site, so you need to make some optimization changes. Um, or maybe because the 404s, you're leaving traffic to some key pages that you didn't know about before. Or again, you, you forgot your robots file or, or your SEO value just went down because you forgot some meta tag descriptions or you're blocking some extra URLs. So keep, an, keep a close eye on your metrics um, in the days and, and even months after launch to see if you can. So you're, you're always going to take a little bit of a dip from SEO, but the, the goal is to get, get even really quickly. And then obviously, you know, you're not doing a redesign to, to stay stagnant. You're doing it to, to grow. Um, so that's, that's the, the list of questions. Obviously, there's a lot of other questions, but in a summary, um, we went over some, some extra resources. There are other, other extra resources as well, but the idea here is that you, you need to get involved in the community if you're not technical, or if you are technical, start getting involved in the community in some way, um, either online or, or through forums, or if you have groups within the, the company, start asking questions to, to the developers um, about WordPress. Um, start figuring out what it can do, what it's going to be doing in the future, because it's constantly evolving. Um, you know, in the past two years, it's gone from, or, or even more, it's gone from just a, a blogging tool to now a full-fledged CM, full CMS and full-fledged development platform. Um, went through some common project management tools. These are all online-based. There are, there are others as well. Do some research there. Uh, maybe use some other people and in, in see if they're, if they're of value. Um, but using some type of a tool, some type of a tracking system, more than email, is, is pretty critical. And then setting some standards. Um, getting these set up front going to help you a lot in, in the future because you're getting an idea of, of a baseline of just how things have to happen. And this is applicable to a, a single person team 
all the way up to a large scale of 20, 30 people. Um, obviously, it's more critical for the, for the big teams, but even as a single person, you need to start setting some standards of how you're doing development, um, because eventually you're going to work on bigger teams. And then we went through the technologies, but then we just focused quite a bit on the, some questions to get answered. So now, I think we, have, we, we still have some time. People have other questions? Yes, I, and they want me to bring you up to the mic if you don't mind, or I can repeat the question. Um, so, in your um, beginning, you talked about some open source project management tools. Yes. And one of them was Open Atrium, and that's on Drupal. Yes. Are there any tools that might be on work? Yes. Um, I found a few plugins um, that do some, some similar things. I don't personally use them, so I didn't list them. Um, but, but there are, I, I should have written down the URL. I'll try to keep, get that updated on the slides. But there's a list of plugins for, for WordPress as well that do a lot of project management type, type um, things. Um, and, and for either one, what I would recommend is obviously, this isn't something that you build into the site that you're building, just to keep in mind. It's something that you would have a site on the side um, to track your project management. So you can do it for multiple projects, obviously. Anything else? I know everyone wants to get out for lunch. <laughs> all right. Uh, I'm, I'm available. I'm, I'm here all day. I'm also some other people from North Point. Um, we do have an office in Boston. We're hiring. If there's developers, um, or some project managers. Um, so, thank you.